Uh, tonight, though, as we are in day seven, I thought I would talk to you on the topic of prayer. And I want to look at Philippians chapter four. I'm, I'm trying to get better in my preaching because I found that I say a lot of things each week. I'll say, like, this is my favorite verse or like, I love this passage. And I'm exaggerating. And so I, I want to confess that I lie often. Um, I'm, I'm working on it. I'm going to get better transitions. But um, with that said, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. <laughs> Philippians chapter four, verse six. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Watch this. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I want to talk to you tonight from the subject, anytime anxiety comes. Anytime anxiety comes. Would you pray with me, Lord? We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that tonight we sense that you are in this place, Lord, whether we're here in this room or we're watching online or listening by podcast, I pray that your presence would permeate all the atmospheres that people would experience you, see Jesus, hear Jesus, be changed and transformed. We believe you can do it, we believe you will do it. And if you're in agreement with that prayer, all of God's people said? Amen. All of God's people said? Amen. Come on, all over this room, can we go ahead and give God a big shout of praise? Come on. Come on, we can do better than that. Go ahead and give them some real praise tonight. Uh, I just got back from a two-week vacation. And I am feeling refreshed. I am feeling revitalized. I am fired up. I believe the best is yet to come for Vu Church. Sometimes you need a vacation to remind you of that. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, about three to four weeks before vacation, I was experiencing... Uh, like some mild forms of anxiety. I'm, I'm slow to say that word because I think that word gets thrown out a whole lot, but the only way I can explain what I've been experiencing is kind of like this tightness in my chest, but best dis description would be that kind of like a constant just nervousness that just wouldn't leave me. And I, I decided like, yo, I, I, I think we need to get some rest. And honestly, like research is telling us right now that anxiety is on the rise. Like, Every year, anxiety increases in this nation. Suicide increases. Uh, medication increases. Uh, we live busy lives. In fact, have you noticed that we're almost like kind of proud of our business? How you doing? I'm busy. What, 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 what's been going on? Just busy, bro. Like literally Everybody is busy. I, I have yet to meet people who are like, man, I'm just walking in peace every day. Super, a lot of margin, a lot of extra time, just looking for stuff to fill my time. No one says that. Everybody is busy. Yeah. And this busyness for many of us is contributing to a culture of anxiety. A lot of things that research has shown us about why anxiety is rising. But, but one of the number one things that almost everybody agrees with in 2019 is that the rise of anxiety is due to a large part of this little computer that we all carry in our pocket. I've got one here. It's called a cell phone or a smartphone. How many of you have a smartphone out there? Yeah, four of us. Okay, well, I want to talk to you. No. <laughs> this little device, which we carry with us, my precious. Some of us are crazy enough to lay it on our pillow at night. Are you still there? You know? They say that our generation is the most connected generation of all time. And I understand the sentiment, but I think a better way of saying it is that we are the generation that has the potential to have the most information in our hands. Because it's true, we have the power to be connected, but would you agree with me that we're more disconnected than we've ever been? We're addicted to this thing. Like, full on addicted to this little device that helps us compare our lives to other people's lives that reminds us of what we don't have going, that reminds us that we should be going harder and that we should be going further. And we take it like it's a drug every single day. So, so going on vacation, I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try to put this into practice. I decided I'm gonna do a total unplug. Two weeks, I'm off the phone. I got rid of the devil known as the Instagram. And um, <laughs> it's actually kind of amazing because I don't know if you know this, but some of you, this is like a first time, like, woohoo, like, like, do you know that there's like this button on the iPhone and there's another button that, that if you hold both of them simultaneously down for about three seconds, this thing turns off? <laughs> That's all I got, folks. I'll see you next Sunday for Vision Sunday. God bless. Like, turns off. You know what's really crazy that I learned when I turned it off? 
It's like, I think the people um, over there that made the iPhone, I think that like they were Christians. Because when you power down the iPhone, the last thing that you see is an apple with a bite out of it. As if to say, if you keep eating from that tree, you're never going to find satisfaction. You're never going to find peace. You're never going to find hope. You're going to have to eat from a different tree. It's like a reminder of the Genesis account right there in front of you. <laughs> and so I turned the phone off. And anyone out there that you like, you conquer something for a day, and the moment you conquer it for a day, you become the judge of everyone else who hasn't conquered it? Like you went to the gym twice, you're like, look at this entire, this generation's obese, nobody works out. Like, you've been there twice. Well, that, that's me, actually. Like, I got off my iPhone, and like, before I know it, I, I realized, I watched... People are addicted. We're walking. We're at dinner. It, it, every, all ages, even old people are like, it's slower. It's like, nah, 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 but it's still happening. It's slower, but we're all consuming. And we sit around and we wonder, why is anxiety increasing? Why is depression on the rise? Why are we more medicated than ever before? Why is suicide continuing to climb? I'll tell you, it's simple. It's because we're nonstop. We're nonstop working. We're nonstop busy. We're nonstop scrolling. We're nonstop swiping. We are nonstop. And the problem is if you don't ever stop, you'll never get still. And if you don't get still, you are going to miss out on the beautiful fact that he is God. For the scripture says, be still and know that I am God. We are so distracted and busy that we never take time to stop, to get still, and by prayer, get into God's presence. It's only in God's presence that you can hear his voice. I feel like for the last two weeks, my soul has been refreshed, and I feel like I've been able to hear the whisper of heaven. Much of it I can't wait to share with you over the coming months as we get into the fall, but but tonight, I felt that I really want to speak on this subject of defeating anxiety through prayer. You know, I love the Bible. The more and more I read it, the more I'm convinced that it's, it's real. Um, <laughs> that's scary. And some people are like, really? What? I thought he was my pastor. Um, no, no, like, I don't want to scare you. I'm just saying the more I read it, the more I'm even more convinced that it, that's real. Like, this stuff was written thousands of years ago, but when I read Philippians 4, which we read tonight, I'm like, dude, this is more relevant tonight than it ever has been. Because this is what the Apostle Paul writes. It's really simple. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Someone say anything. But in every situation, someone say every situation. By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Watch this. And the peace of God. Someone say peace which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I like Paul because he's just straightforward. He's super clear. You got a problem? It's called anxiety. Here's the solution. It's called prayer. What's the result of prayer? Peace. Did you know what the payoff to prayer is peace? I have a sense tonight that if I could convince you that the payoff to prayer was peace, some of you would start praying more. Yeah. Anyone out there who could use some peace? Where you at? Okay, once again, six of us. Are we going to get better participation tonight? Okay, like, good news, Voo Church, we got the plug on peace. Because <laughs> the scripture says that when we go to God in prayer, the result is the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. Come on, is there any faith-filled people in the room tonight? Maybe you're like, Rich, okay, but you don't understand. You don't know my story. You don't know about my life right now. I ain't got no time for peace. You never met my boss. Can't get no peace over there. You don't know my husband. Ain't no peace in my home. You never met my kids. <laughs> you don't know my situation. You would be absolutely correct, absolutely right. I don't know all of those factors and all of those variables. Yet I'm not sure if you're listening to me tonight. What the scripture says is that when we go to God in prayer, what happens is we don't get man's peace. We get the peace of God. The peace of God is interesting because according to the scripture, the peace of God transcends all understanding. Meaning that God's peace is superior to your earthly situation. 
a good translation of this verse is God's peace is illogical. So if you have a situation that doesn't make sense, good news, your God has peace that doesn't make sense. Listen, your situation might not change, but your soul will. Oh, come on, am I preaching to anybody tonight? Your soul will. Listen, when anxiety comes, pray. Because Paul's like, I want to give you an equation. Here's the equation. Anxiety divided by prayer equals peace. Anytime anxiety comes, pray. Now let me preface it because I want to make sure that we're sensitive tonight because this is a very, very polarizing topic even in our nation today as people talk about it. I am not suggesting to you that you shouldn't go to a counselor. I'm by no means up here hollering saying don't go see a therapist. Don't take a prescription. I'm not saying don't get into a support group. I'm not saying don't Sabbath. Some of you just need a vacation. Take a vacation. Get into a crew. Get into community. Do all the stuff. What I'm saying is, is that anytime anxiety comes, pray first. Pray first. It's funny because some of us were hearing this message right now, like, dude, this pastor, he's old school. This is super cliche. The people that think that prayer is cliche are people that don't pray. <laughs> don't knock it until you try it. Because I am telling you, I can't promise your situation will turn around. What I can promise you is that your soul can be revived. Your soul can be refreshed. Come on, anytime anxiety comes, where's the prayer warriors at? Somebody pray tonight. Go ahead and give God some praise in this place. Anytime anxiety comes, pray, pray first. Do all the stuff, just pray first. It's funny, right? Because the antidote to our anxiety is prayer. Yet our church is full of type A people, which I love. I am one of you. And type A people are right now are going, oh, okay, yeah. Thank you, Rich, for bringing this to my attention. It's day seven. I can't wait for day eight. I'm going to give it anxiety an attack. I'm coming with prayer. The, the funny thing is about a lot of us type A people is that we start plotting and we start planning. And before you know it, the antidote to our anxiety, which is prayer, which brings peace, actually starts to cause us anxiety. <laughs> like, even right now, you, like, to me, you're like, oh my goodness, like, okay. Like, you're getting anxious. You're like, oh, okay, okay, oh, okay. But if I pray, what happens, if, what happens if I pray and nothing happens? That makes me anxious. Some of you didn't come to prayer the last Wednesday because the thought of going to a prayer meeting made you anxious. Oh my goodness, what would I do for one hour? What are they gonna say? What are they gonna do? I don't know how to do, I've never done that. What do you say? How long do you do that for? Do you sit? Do you stand? What if they hear me pray? They don't like my prayers. They're like, that's it. You're out of here. You can't be a part of this church. You know what? I'm not gonna go. I'm anxious. Like, <laughs> relax. R relax. Tonight, I, I wanna try to help you because one of my jobs getting to pastor this place is trying to help all of us. We're all in different spots. Some of you are more spiritually mature than me. Others of you are not as spiritually mature as me. We're all on this journey together. And we're all looking for different ways to get our faith activated. So I'm always looking for, trying to help. I just want to get people praying. Like, I just want to get you praying because it's the source to your faith. It's huge. And so we come up with all sorts of different just kind of systems to pray, to help people pray. And one of the easiest things you can do when you're struggling to get to praying is the Bible is full of prayers from the past. And what I have learned is that when I don't know what to pray, sometimes I'll pray somebody else's prayer. And when I start praying their prayer, God will start giving me my own prayer. Tonight, I wanna do something really simple. It's a different structure of a sermon, but hopefully you can follow. I wanna show you four case studies from the Old Testament, four different prayers that when fear, worry, anxiety came upon these men, they prayed and peace resulted. The first is um, the prayer of honesty. The point of prayer is for relationship with God. Every healthy relationship has to be built on honesty. My hope for our community is not that you would say all the things you think you're supposed to say, but that you would say the real stuff of what's going on inside of you. God can't heal who you pretend to be. And so many of us, we come before God and we wear this mask 
But the truth of the matter is is that God's just looking for honest prayers. Where are you at actually? God, this is what's really going on. Think about some of your deepest relationships for a moment, like your best friends or your closest relationships. My guess is the reason why they are such deep relationships is because you've had multiple experiences with them. And all these experiences have showcased different emotions. In fact, the more people see the different emotions that you have, the bond gets tighter. I just think for a moment, um, think about the person in your life that makes you laugh the hardest. You thinking about him? <laughs> You're like, yeah, that dude's an idiot, but I love him, bro. <laughs> or, 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 or think about the person that you celebrate the loudest with. You getting that? Per- like, think about it. Uh, think about the person that you, you've cried the most with in your life. Some of you, it's been years since you've cried. And the only time you do cry is when you're all alone. Think about, this is a really fun one. Think about the person you fight the best with. I was thinking about these questions this week and guess what? Like my wife fills all these categories. (laughs) But it shouldn't be surprising because my closest relationship on this earth is Dawn Cherie. We've had so many experiences. She's seen all of my emotions. And the truth of the matter is, is that honesty produces intimacy. The more honest I am, the more revealing I am, the more our relationship begins to grow. God is not concerned with you saying polished and perfect words. God wants to have an intimate, real, authentic relationship with you. He wants to see all of your emotions. He wants all the experiences. It's really interesting because you can catch a whole lot by listening to someone pray. You can learn a whole lot about the relationship with God. Like, have you ever noticed like people are one way, they're like, hey, what's up, bro? Good to see you, man. And they start praying to become somebody completely different. <laughs> Have you ever experienced this? It's like, what's up, man? Yeah, yeah. You want, oh, pray? Oh, okay. Uh, I get real formal, you know. Uh, uh, dear Heavenly Father, how, are, how art thou, thouest? Uh, I beseech thee, on, on, uh, according to the brethren of the saints of the uh, Almighty God, under the one nation, true God. Is that the Pledge of Allegiance? What's, what's up? I'm, is that... Was that a scene from Hamlet? What was that? (laughs) Ever met people that they're super chill in real life. They start praying, they become aggressive. Mm, Let's go, God. Mm, Let's go, God. Mm, Let's go, God. All right, yeah. It's like, I think you have suppressed anger. What is up? You ever met the person who's like super flowy? Hey, Daddy. Um, <laughs> hey, Daddy. Hey. Now, none of this is wrong, but the point that I'm trying to make is the way you address God is based upon how you've assessed God. So you address Him based upon your assessment. So somebody who deals with God in such a formal way is because they see God as this boss. Some of us, we see God as like this warlord. So it's like, yeah, we're going to battle. Some people just see God as this mystical abstract being. And so therefore, when they talk to him, it's always in this flowy language. And the more they whisper, the more they breathe, the more that they think that somehow they're more spiritual. I'm not even actually mocking those spaces. What I'm trying to get our community to understand is let's assess God based upon the scriptures. Let's assess God based upon how he's described. He's our heavenly father. He's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Come on, is there anybody out there who wants a real relationship with God? God's not concerned with your vocabulary. He's after intimacy. And when you start to pray honest prayers, It's amazing how God begins to meet you where you are. I love King David. When I think about a case study of someone who prayed honestly, I always think about David. Because as you read the Psalms, you see that this guy just opens up his heart. Like you go read Psalms. This guy holds nothing back. There's times that he's angry at God. You know what's crazy is there's people in this room tonight that you are angry with God. The only problem is you've never told him. You haven't told him because you convince yourself, oh my goodness, he's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. You don't even know what that stuff means. <laughs> and if 
you were angry with a friend, the only way you could reconcile and the only way you could have relationship is if you were to confess that and talk about that and discuss it. <laughs> Scripture says that David was a man after God's own heart and I've always, always been drawn to that little verse. Why did he have a heart like God? Maybe it's because he was not afraid to share his heart. <laughs> Much like our God is not afraid to share and be vulnerable with his heart towards us. David was a man of incredible accolades and success, yet he matched those with some pretty big epic failures. Uh, One of his greatest failures, the scripture says that when it was time for the men to go off to war, David decided to stay back and he didn't go to war. One day when he was on his balcony, if you can believe it, he looks down and he sees this woman and she's bathing. Her name was Bathsheba, which makes me laugh because like Bathsheba in a bath, okay? (laughs) And he begins to lust after her and he takes her and she ends up getting pregnant. The problem with this is that she was a married woman, meaning that he had committed an affair. But he didn't stop there. He got more scandalous with it. He had her husband brought to the front lines of a battle where that husband was killed. David went from just having an affair to becoming a murderer. The prophet Nathan came to confront him because he was saying, listen, you might be the most powerful man in Israel, but there is no one who comes before God. And Nathan came and confronted him and actually began to scold him. Watch David. Because here he is in this low moment. Here he is in this moment where he has shame on his back. The reason why many of you carry anxiety is because of things that happened in the past. Current struggles that you can't get past. But watch David as he repents. He just gets real. Psalm 56, this is his prayer. You could take it tonight. He says, you want me to be completely truthful? So teach me wisdom. Take away my sin and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Make me hear sounds of joy and gladness. Let the bones you crushed be happy again. Turn your face from my sins and wipe out all my guilt. Create in me a pure heart, God, and make my spirit right again. David is getting honest. He's being truthful about what's actually going on. He's recognizing his mistake. He's repenting and he's praying the prayer of honesty. Don't get me wrong. This baby boy that Bathsheba gave birth to, because of David's sin, that baby died. Yet because of David's honest prayer of repentance, another baby was born named Solomon. And Solomon went on to be maybe the greatest king that Israel ever saw. Why? Because when anxiety met David's life, he divided it with the prayer of honesty. And guess what? Peace showed up in his future. Am I preaching to anybody tonight? Go ahead and give God some praise. Anytime anxiety comes, the prayer of honesty... (laughs) brings peace. God, this is what's really going on. Taking the mask off. You already know. I might as well just be honest about it. It's not just the prayer of honesty, but it's, it's the prayer of hope. Hope's one of those kind of funny words that like gets said a lot in church, but we don't actually like know what it is. Like hope, you know? Uh, hope is the building blocks to your faith. A good like theological working definition of hope is hope is a quiet, calm assurance that God is working even when you can't sense him. The problem for many of us is that our hopes are low because we're managing our disappointment. We don't want to get disappointed so we fail to get our hopes up. Because we read the scripture, hope deferred makes the heart grow sick. And so it's easier to say, you know what? Let me not get my hopes up so I can spare my heart. Yet that's one scripture, but you got to read another scripture, which says it's impossible to please God without faith. And faith, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, which we just studied all summer, says now faith is being sure of what we hope for. I got news for you, Voo Church. It's time for you to get your hopes up. It's time for you to get your faith up. It's time for you to believe for more, declare for more, confess for more. The best is still in front of you. I don't know what it is, but God loves when you ask for big stuff. God loves to collaborate with you, but he requires that you request it out of him. One of my favorite case studies is the prayer of Jabez. You probably never heard of Jabez. There's only two verses in the Bible about him. Yet one is his prayer. Look at this, 1 Chronicles 4, verse 9. This is the prayer of hope. Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. His mother had named him Jabez, saying, I gave birth to him in pain. Meaning she's like, this is painful. Your name now is Jabez. It's like, oh, this hurts. I'm gonna call you Hurt. That's his story. 
And Jabez cried out to the God of Israel, oh, that you would bless me and enlarge my territory. Listen to the hope, listen to the faith. Let your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain. Watch this. And God granted his request. This is the prayer of hope. Jabez determined, you know what? I was born into pain, but my future can be full of peace. I was born into pain, but my future can still have a purpose. I'm gonna get my hopes up. I'm gonna pray the prayer of faith. I'm gonna believe that God can use me. He prays, it's a short prayer. What's he pray for? He prays for blessing. God bless me. He says, you know, God, like, enlarge my territory. What's he pray? He's praying for influence. Not that my name would be great, but your name would be great. He says, God, put your hand upon me. God's hand is a representation of God's anointing on your life. God, give me an anointing. God, God, keep me free from harm and pain. What's he praying? He's praying for protection. You're out there going, I don't know where to start. I don't know how to begin. I got so much stuff coming against me. Why not pray the prayer of hope? Why not pray Jabez's prayer? Why not wake up every morning and go, God, would you bless me today? God, would you give me influence? Not that my name would be great, but your name would be great. God, would you put an anointing on my life? Would you anoint my word? God, would you protect me, protect my family? Put a hedge of protection around us. Anybody out there need God's protection? Why don't you go ahead and just thank him in advance for a moment? I need his hand on my life. I'm getting my hopes up tonight. It's the prayer of hope. You know what the crazy thing is, this simple little prayer? The craziest part about these two verses? And God granted his request. What? God did what he asked for. You want to know a surefire way not to get the desires of your heart? Never ask. See, often the miracles that we don't receive are simply the ones we never asked for. I'm not saying tonight that if you ask God, he won't say no. All I'm saying is if you ask God, he might say yes. Come on, who wants to take their chances with the might say yes? Come on, somebody get your hopes up tonight. I, uh, I got convicted on vacation. Walking around, praying, talking to God. I don't know what it is. I just want to be honest. It's like, I feel like maybe I've been trying to protect God. That's what I would say to myself. But really, it was about me just managing my disappointment. We're coming up on Vision Sunday, which is next week. I can't wait for us to gather as a church Labor Day weekend. It's going to be incredible as we talk about where we're going. It's not like a normal church service. It's, it's different. It's talking about projects and areas that we're going for. And it's not really a mystery that like anyone who's been a part of the VU journey knows that we're in need of a, like our own building. Thank God for the public school system. Thank God that we're able to load in, but we're seeing four to 5,000 people show up here every week. <laughs> we don't own any of these properties. It's all built off of servant leaders showing up. And I think it's been great, but man, I look forward to the day that we have our own piece of property, that we have our own auditorium. Can I, can I get an agreement right there? But I'm kind of like walking around and I'm kind of praying and I'm kind of thinking and I'm like, I don't know, like, I just haven't been asking God about that. And I think I want to say I do it because I'm like noble, like I'm humble, but it's false humility. I don't want to bother God. He's been so good to us already. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me as I was kind of thinking of some thoughts and just slightly scratching my imagination of what I could believe for, for our community. And I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Rich, um, you've never talked to me about any of that stuff before. Wow. I got convicted. I was like, all right. I went home, pulled up Pinterest. I said, this is what I want the building to look like. Pick that picture. This is what the carpet needs to look like. Pick that picture. I like this paint scheme, that picture. We need a coffee shop. That's the coffee shop right there. We need a warehouse that we can call a dream center. Pick that one out right there. I don't know about you, but I want to get my hopes up. Come on, somebody give him a shout of praise. Anytime anxiety comes, you pray with hope. God's not done with me. God's just getting started with me. I started in pain. I'm going to end in peace. 
Anytime anxiety comes, you pray the prayer of honesty, you pray the prayer of hope. But thirdly, it's the prayer of help. It's the prayer of help. Listen to me, you live long enough, you're gonna come up against some obstacles and some challenges that there are no human resources that can solve your problem. And prayer is a lifeline when death is imminent. The world will try to convince you that you got nothing left. You always remind yourself in that moment, I got my greatest weapon left. It's called prayer. And the Bible is full of stories of people who prayed the prayer of help. God, it's too big. It's too great. I, the obstacles are too large. The situation, I need, your, I need supernatural supply. As a little boy, I loved hearing the story of Hezekiah, the king of Judah. Israel was subdivided. The north was known as Israel. The south was known as Judah. Israel had been conquered by the Assyrian army led by a king by the name of King Sennacherib. You read First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and it's story after story of good kings and bad kings, some who trusted God, others that fell. Hezekiah, the king of Judah at this time, was a righteous man of God who feared God. And he gets wind that Sennacherib is coming to conquer him, and the Assyrian army was massive and large. And all Hezekiah can do is pray the prayer of help. Look at 2 Kings chapter 19. I want you to see this prayer because maybe you're there tonight and this is the prayer that you should pick up on. Watch his tone, watch his vibe. Hezekiah received a letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord. Here we go. Watch his prayer to God. Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim. You alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Starts nice. Give ear, Lord. And here, he's talking to God. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. If I was God, I'd be like, I created your eyes, you little. <laughs> Take your eyes. <laughs> Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words Sennacherib has sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste in these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. I don't know about you, but are you catching the tone of Hezekiah? He's like provoking God. Like, I wish you would do something. He's like, you know what this man is, but open up your eyes, God. This man is doing stuff. Have you heard? Like, like of course God has heard. He's God. I want you, have you heard? But I like it. Because I think when it comes to the prayer of help, you got to get some strength. You got to get some confidence. You got to get some boldness. Because watch, this is great. This is kind of crazy too. Verse 35, chapter 19. That night. <laughs> watch this, this gets morbid quick. Um, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. He returned to Nineveh and stayed there. Um, did you just read that? <laughs> God, help us! We need you to do something! They go to bed that night. One angel! One angel! came and took out 185,000 Assyrian soldiers? One? One. Uno. I read the Bible with imagination. I, I thought all those dudes in Judah were like, yeah, yeah, mess with us again. If you keep messing with us next time, God's gonna send two angels. Listen to me, your problem is not more powerful than your God. And prayer brings peace. Oh, but baby, it brings so much more. It brings the power of God. Prayer brings restoration. Prayer brings healing. Prayer brings deliverance. Prayer brings breakthrough. Are there any people who believe in the power of prayer tonight? Go ahead and give God some praise. Just come on and praise him. Help! I need your help. Maybe you can't pray Jabez's prayer. Maybe you are not in a place that you are emotionally healthy enough to talk to God about all of what's going on in the inside of you, but I got a feeling that you could pray, 
Help. Help. I know it doesn't sound like super spiritual, but it's quite profound. Help me, Holy Spirit. I need your help. I need your help. I, I need your help. Because you serve a God with one angel. Imagine if he sent two. Help. Anytime, anytime anxiety comes, pray, help. I'm not saying don't do the other stuff. I'm just saying pray first. Pray with honesty. Pray with hope. Pray, help. But lastly, it's, it's the prayer of habit. It's not what we do occasionally. It's what we do consistently. And prayer is not our last resort. It is our first response. That we want Vu Church to have a habit of prayer. Like this season that we're in right now, twice a year we do this. We, we take 21 days and literally our church started this way. It wasn't like we gathered, like we should pray. It was like we were praying and then our church was birthed. And so we don't do this twice a year to be like, okay, cool. We prayed in August and we'll see you again in January. We'll, pre- we'll, we'll start praying again. No, no, no. It's not a gimmick. It, it, it's simply a catalyst to get men and women who, who have never caught this revelation to say, I want to activate my faith. I want this to be a part of my lifestyle. The scripture says to pray without ceasing. I actually think the power is not in the quantity of your prayer. I think it's the frequency of your prayer. I want to live my whole life. God, I need you to right now, Jesus. Thank you. Hey, how are you guys doing? Good to see you. Holy Spirit, I need you. Hey, nice to meet you. Holy Spirit, you trust him? Oh. I, just want, I want to be in conversation with God. Why? Because prayer is like oxygen. Faith can't survive without it. We talk about having faith. If you're not praying, I don't know how strong that faith is going to be. We, we need a habit of prayer. Our leadership team here at VU, especially if you're new, we, we absolutely know that this thing, it doesn't move forward off of our gifting and our talent. Let me be the first to say, especially if you're new here, like I don't have what it takes. I'm not skilled enough. I'm not talented enough. I'm definitely not spiritual enough. I'm not good enough. I don't have enough creativity. I don't have the capacity. I can't move this forward. The only way this moves forward is through a move of God. And a move of God comes when we are on our knees. I look forward to the day that this church is more known for its prayer meetings than for our Instagram page. I'm serious. I've said it many times. I look forward today that our Wednesday night prayer meetings that only happen twice a year, I look forward today. They start at 7.30 this Wednesday. You can come, but I look forward to the day that people are out the door, lying around the building at 7 p.m. waiting. What are you doing? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I got this habit. I can't kick it. <laughs> What's your habit? I just pray. <laughs> and if my community's praying together, whoo, I'm not gonna miss that opportunity. I wanna lock into that moment and I wanna be encouraged by their faith. Because when anxiety attacks me, I can only divide it with prayer. And then his peace, which transcends all understanding, it it guards my heart. That's that's your soul, that's your feeling, but then it, it guards your mind. Aren't you thankful that Jesus cares about your mental health? And the best case study I can think of when it comes to the prayer of habit is the prophet Daniel. There's a whole book in the Bible in the Old Testament designated to Daniel. He's a very cool guy. There's lots of fun stories, but his most famous story is the story of Daniel in the lion's den. You ever read that story? Ever hear that story? You guys are scaring me tonight. Honestly, like there's six of us. Like I'm the worst pastor. I got to teach you the, okay. Um, We got a long time together, so we will teach these stories. Um, Daniel was a Jewish man who was living in exile. Studying the exile brings great hope to all believers today. Um, Remember that king I just told you about named Hezekiah, who was the king of Judah? 
he served God, but once he died, a new king came up and didn't serve God. And what happened was, was that Babylon came and invaded. And ultimately both Israel and Judah became exiled. They were slaves in a foreign nation known as Babylon. And Babylon was a barbaric place. It was full of pagan gods and heathen kings. Yet somehow, even in this culture, there are different stories of prophets and men of God who rose through the ranks and not only made a difference in Babylon, but had favor from Babylon. It's funny because I think there's a lot of people living in Miami that are Christians, yet they just stay away and they run away and they go, it's just so difficult to be a Christian. But friend, if God could use Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego in exile in Babylon, don't you think he could use you and I right here in Miami, Florida? There's hope. And, and Daniel had great favor with the kings of Babylon. He served Nebuchadnezzar, then he served Darius. But their advisors never liked him because their advisors were like, yeah, why is this exile getting favored that we should be getting? And so in Daniel chapter six, these advisors tried to plot against Daniel. And they looked at his life, but as they looked at his life, they examined that there was no fault. There was nothing they could get him on. The only thing they discovered about him is that he was just a man of prayer. He was a man who, who, who served Jehovah Jireh. So they devised a plan. They went to Darius and they said, Darius, we think that you're the greatest king ever. And we think that it should be a rule one day of the year that if someone prays to any other God other than you, they should be thrown into a pit with lions. The Achilles heel of every great leader is their ego. Darius, not thinking, signs this decree. Let me pick it up. Daniel chapter six, verse 10, because this is, you want, you, want, you want a good Bible verse this week? You're looking for a pick-me-up. You're looking to get fired up. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Watch this. Now, now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, meaning he just heard that if you pray, you get thrown into the lion's den. He went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. He had his windows open. And three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. Watch this. Just as he had done before. Someone say before. I don't know what Daniel's prayer was. All I know is it wasn't new to Daniel. I don't know the words that he said. All I know is that he was a person who had been there before. I got a feeling it was an honest prayer. I got a feeling it was a hope-filled prayer. I got a feeling for sure that it was a help me God prayer. I don't know exactly, but one thing I do know for sure is that it was the prayer of habit because he had been there before. Daniel, what are you thinking? Don't you know if you keep on praying, they're gonna throw you into a pit with lions? Why not just stop today? Just take one day off. Just take a break. He's like, nah. I got this habit, man. And it's true. I might die in the lion's den, but I am certain that I am dead without prayer. I'm gonna take my chances with the lions because without prayer, I got nothing. The scripture says he's thrown in the lion's den. The next morning, they roll the stone away. And when they roll the stone away, would you believe it? There's Daniel standing. He doesn't have a scratch on him. And what is he doing? He's praising and he's worshiping God. And he declared, my God, shut the mouths of the lions. Somebody give God some praise. Somebody give God some glory. You serve a God who can shut the mouths of a lion. But friend, I believe it's habitual prayer that shuts lion's mouths. And maybe you hear it, you're like, yo, but bro, like, I, I don't have a lion. I got some anxiety because I, I got bills to pay. And I'm worried because I got to work this thing out with my girl, but like, I ain't got no lion. You're kind of right. I know what you mean, but, but you're, you're probably missing it. Um, my son, Wyatt, uh, he just turned 19 months. He's just incredible. We just had this awesome vacation with him. And, and Wyatt right now is learning um, about animals. He loves animals. Animal. And so uh, you got to try it with him when you see him. You go, hey, Wyatt, um, what noise does a lion make? And he goes, roar. <laughs> it was really cute. And then I'll go, I'll, go, I'll go, Wyatt, what noise does a cow make? He goes, moo. 
But then he kind of gets confused. I'm like, why, what noise does a doggy make? Rawr! I go, why, what noise does a, does a cat make? He goes, moo! <laughs> so he knows two noises. Is, um... <laughs> but we were, we were in Santa Barbara, California, and Don Shred and we said, let's take him to the zoo because there was a lion at that zoo. So we took him to the zoo to see his first lion and he's going, rawr, rawr. I said, let's up the ante. The next day I was like, let's, let's, take, him to, let's take him to the movie these. I thought it was his first movie. I just found out that Don Shree actually took him to a movie when he was six months of age. Didn't tell me about it. Black Panther. <laughs> Thanks for sharing the memory with me. And um, so I was like, this is his first movie, The Lion King, you know. I love The Lion King, you know. He's holding back, he's hiding of what I can't decide. Why won't he be the king? I know he's the king. I, I love it. I love the part. No, 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 I love it. And I want to share this moment with my son because he loves lions. We saw about four minutes of the movie. Um, the problem was that every time a lion came on the screen, which is like what the whole movie's about. Um, <laughs> my son, Wyatt, would lose his mind. He would start going, rawr, rawr, rawr. <laughs> I'm not joking. I left the theater nine different times. I'm walking with this, rawr. Everyone's like, what's wrong with your baby? I was like, shut up, he's passionate. You know, like, like, like. I had to leave the theater because his roaring was a distraction to the story that was being told. I love these four Old Testament case stories, but aren't you thank you, thankful for a New Testament God? That peace is not actually a place. Peace is a person and his name is Jesus. And Paul's not just giving you a cliche. He's talking about you can have peace you can have Jesus, which transcends all understanding. But it wasn't just Paul that knew this truth. It was his friend, Peter. Watch what Peter says. First Peter chapter five, verse six. Humble yourselves. When you pray, you're submitting to something greater than yourself. The result is humility. God, I'm desperate. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Watch this. Cast all your anxiety on him. Who's him? Jesus. Because Jesus cares for you. Watch this. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Cast all your anxiety on him. God, I'm praying right now. Divide my anxiety with prayer and let it result in peace. But it's habitual prayer that shuts the mouth of the lion. I don't know if you saw it, but we all have a lion. I know you think your bills are causing anxiety. That could be true. And I know you think your relationship's causing you anxiety. That, that could be true. And I think, I know that the future may be causing you anxiety. I know the past may be causing you anxiety, but there is something for sure on this earth that is causing you anxiety and it is the devil. And he is described as a lion who's roaming the earth roaring. And what we don't understand is that every time we listen to his roar, we get distracted and we get busy. 
and we start swiping and we start looking over there and we start looking over there and we just keep going. Oh, he's just roaring. He's roaring and God's trying to tell a story and God's trying to use you, but you can't pay attention to the story God's telling because the lion is roaring and he's roaring and he's roaring and he's roaring and we're distracted and he's intervening and he's putting up hindrances and obstacles and we're missing out on the peace because we're listening to the lion's roar. Oh, but friend, I got news for you. The same God in Daniel chapter six, that through the prayer of habit, shut the mouths of the lion, is the same God in 2019, that when you start to pray with some habits, I'm telling you what, he can shut the mouth of the devil and he can try to roar, but listen, you're totally focused on the story God is telling. My best is in front of me. I got the peace of God. You can't steal my joy, devil. Come on if you believe it. Lift your hands. Lift your voice.